Thank you. All right, welcome everybody. My name is Paul Primer. Uh, I'm the director of the Law and Public Affairs program here. Uh, we are co-sponsoring this event with the Center for Policy Research on Energy and the Environment, CPRI. We are LAPA. They're CPRI. Two good acronyms. Um, we're very excited to have Michael Berger here today. Uh, Michael Berger, as the uh, uh, first slide shows, the executive director of the Saban Center for Climate Change Law uh, at Columbia University. He's also a senior research scholar and lecturer uh, in the law school there. Uh, prior to that, he was an associate professor of law at Roger Williams School of Law. Uh, he was an attorney uh, in, uh, in the Environmental Law Division uh, for New York City's uh, Office of the Corporation Council. Uh, he's a frequent author uh, in uh, these areas of subjects, and he'll be talking today about uh, the law and science of climate change attribution. Um, so we're very excited to have uh, Professor Berger. He's going to speak, and I think he's going to answer questions uh, himself. Uh, great. Well, good afternoon, everybody. Um, and I'd like to start off by saying thanks for the invitation to come and speak to you today. Uh, it's a real pleasure to be down here um, to talk to you about the law and science of climate change attribution. Um, I'm just going to dive right in. Uh, and I will say, if you have questions or comments along the way, please feel free to stick your hand up and intervene. Um, I do have sort of a ways to go through to get through to get through to get through the slides, um, but we can stop at any point. So, um, at this point in time, the um, correspondence between increasing um, levels of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere uh, and increases in global temperature is well established. Um, the temperature gain that we've seen um, at the current date, which is about one degree Celsius. Um, above pre-industrial levels is, as you can see from this chart, outside the scope, outside the range of what has been experienced in the entirety of human uh, civilization and throughout the entirety of the Holocene era. Um, two degrees of global warming, which is the internationally agreed upon um, level of um, what's not too dangerous um, for human beings to cause, except for 1.5 degrees is the better level, um, is well, well outside of anything that we've ever experienced before on planet Earth um, as a species. Uh, four degrees, uh, or the four to five degrees Celsius range, is literally off the chart. Um, and I like to show this chart, the, this graph, because it shows you really how far outside the range um, we are on a trajectory to be. And that, that four to five degree range, of course, is the business as usual. That's the, that's the trajectory we are currently on. The global warming that we have witnessed already has um, had major planetary effects, including record low levels of Arctic sea ice extent and thickness. Uh, and you'll have to pardon that these slides are a couple of years old at this point, um, but the trends remain similar or the same. Um, record low levels of Antarctic sea ice. Um, this led in 2017 to the, um, uh, a large piece of the Larsen ice shelf breaking off, uh, an area the size of Rhode Island, um, broke off from the Larsen ice shelf. More recently, um, a huge cavity was observed in the Antarctic glacier, uh, signaling further rapid decay. Um, and then we have extreme events. Um, and in 2017, we had a record level of billion dollar weather and climate related disasters, including the trio of hurricanes that hit the Caribbean and Gulf Coast, Maria, Irma, and Harvey, um, wild, record wildfire uh, storms out in California, um, massive drought in the Dakotas and Montana from the spring through the summer, um, hail storms, tornadoes, um, and so forth and so on. So this is a bit old, this chart here, but I think that it still is a good one to show because um, it identifies some of the key areas that climate change poses extraordinary risks in. And this is from the, the Stern Commission report in 2006. Um, and what you can see here is that in, in the one to two degree range, um, we're seeing significant impacts on food systems. Um, we're seeing small mountain glaciers disappearing and water supplies threatened in areas, uh, extensive damage to coral reefs, which is already being observed, uh, rising intensity of extreme events, um, 
as we get further out on the emissions trajectory, so as you move out in time to later in the century, tw after 2050, when we start to see temperature increases of um, 2 degrees to 3 degrees, and then eventually towards the end of the century when we may be seeing temperature increases as much as 4 to 5 degrees, you're seeing that we're looking at um, falling yields, food yields in many uh, developed regions as well as the much more vulnerable developing world, uh, sea levels that threaten major cities around the planet, um, rising number of species facing extinction, and that's on top of the record levels of extinction that we're already seeing, um, uh, even more frequent and intense severe ev uh, extreme events including fires, droughts, floods, um, and heat. Um, and ultimately the risk that will pass, surpass, the, will, will go over the tipping point um, where the feedback loops kick in um, and we start to see large scale shifts in the climate system um, that fundamentally alter uh, life on planet Earth. Uh, this is a, a chart that sort of is more up to date and shows the same kind of information in a slightly different way. Um, here you can see the absolute commitment where we are today, um, our absolute commitment where we're locked into even if we were to stop greenhouse gas emissions um, today, uh, the two degree policy target and then what we're looking at beyond there and you can see that um, the level of additional risk in all of these areas increases and it increases dramatically um, as we increase in temperatures. So what are we doing about this situation and what are we on path to, to, to accomplish or not accomplish? Well, um, our historical levels uh, dating back to 1990 are shown on this chart with projections out to the end of the century. And you can see that, but for the slight dip, um, I'll use this cool technology that was introduced to me. This, this small dip right here around the time of the financial collapse, we've seen a pretty steady increase that continues to this day in temperatures. Um, the business as usual scenario would have us moving in that 4.1 to 4.8 degrees Celsius increase. Policies that are currently in place, if enforced and made effective, would put us in a range of th approximately three to four degrees. The pledges that were made during the Paris Agreement in 2015 under the United Nations Framework Convention on Climate Change process would bring us into the approximately two and a half to three and a third degrees Celsius range. Um, and you can see the reductions, the pathway that we need to be on just to hit the two degree target and then to hit the, the 1.5 degree target. One thing that's notable on the 1.5 degree target is that we actually will have to be into negative emissions territory by the latter uh, part of the century. So in the, in the United States, talking about United States policy, um, this is also a few years old, but it, it remains illustrative. So um, President Obama, when in office, made a commitment um, through the Paris process to reduce emissions 26 to 28 percent below 2005 levels by 2025. That was the, the, the U.S. Um, nationally determined contribution. Um, you can see that we are or were roughly on track to hit the 17% below 2005 levels in 2020, which was reflected in earlier pledge in the Copenhagen process. Um, but that we would, in order to hit the, the 2025 target, where we're going to need to see rapid emissions reductions in the relatively near term. Um, but the policy is that the Obama administration put into place and had in process to put into place, including uh, emission standards for power plants, vehicles, heavy duty trucks, um, aircraft, um, uh, methane from oil and gas sector, and a number of other policies, still left a gap where even in the best scenario, the best case scenario of low growth, high innovation, um, there still was, would be an approximate three to five percent gap between ambition and what the policies that were put in place were uh, set to achieve. Playing this out even a little bit further towards mid-century, um, you can see here in the yellow the, uh, the Paris Pledge commitment. And then you can compare that to emissions that would have been uh, achieved or were, were um, the goal under the Waxman-Markey Bill that failed to pass through Congress back in 2009-2010. Um, and that emissions reduction 
strategy was consistent with an 80% emissions reduction by 2050, uh, which, is which has been talked about as sort of the, consistent with the two degree pathway. Um, so even if the Obama administration policies were put into place and were made effective and achieved what they were set to achieve, um, they were still going to fall short of the Paris Pledge. And even if the Paris Pledge were to be achieved, it was still going to be um, woefully inadequate to achieve the actual long-term goals. That being said, it would put us on a pathway to achieve those goals and, and reflected important and significant contributions to the overall effort. Um, <clears throat> I like, to show, I like this uh, chart because it shows global total net greenhouse gas emissions um, and four different model pathways to achieving um, a significant deep decarbonization and, um, goals. And what you can see here is that, again, in the short term we're looking at sort of continued emissions, but we're looking at a dr drastic and, and, and um, you know, just really a drastic emission reduction in emissions um, by mid-century uh, in order to achieve our climate commitments. This is an, another way of looking at it. <clears throat> That's more stylized in order to achieve what we need to achieve by 2050, 2055, or 2060 to get to net zero. So how are we going to accomplish this, right? The, the task ahead of us is significant. To see emissions reductions like this is going to require a radical transformation of our domestic and global economies. Um, how are we going to, to possibly do this? Well, one of the major hurdles that we're facing at the moment is that the divide between the Republicans and the Democrats on environmental issues um, is extraordinary and has, um, the partisan divide has grown enormously since 1990 which um, coincidentally or not is right around the time that negotiations over climate change um, start to gain significant traction. Um, and regulations started to become a, a, an apparent inevitability. Our president, of course, has long been on the record um, noting that climate change is quote unquote bullshit um, or a Chinese hoax um, or any number of other things. So we're not gonna get leadership from there. Um, Instead, we're getting just the opposite. Um, and so on Inauguration Day in 2017, we at the Sabin Center launched the Climate Deregulation Tracker, which is an online research tool um, that is among a number of different sorts of research tools that we put together on our website, which also includes a litigation database that tracks climate change litigation in the United States and around the world, um, a climate change laws of the world database, which together with the Grantham Institute at the London School of Economics keeps tabs on climate change laws policies um, all, from countries all around the world, a silencing science tracker, which like the climate deregulation tracker we launched in the current administration in order to keep tabs on what the administration is up to in its effort to divorce policymaking from science. Um, and this tracker just focuses specifically on what Congress was doing. Congress isn't doing it now, um, but what it was doing and what the uh, executive branch has been doing to undo the Obama administration's climate policies. And one thing that I can say is that the, the, short, the story is short. Um, the, the, the Trump administration is seeking to reverse every single climate change policy that the Obama administration put on the books or had in process to put onto the books. Um, the effect of this is visible. Um, before we saw how the Obama administration policies were going to achieve some amount of significant emissions reductions, the projections of the impact of the Trump administration's policies are that we will flatline and then emissions will increase in the years ahead as we head out towards the next decade. Um, the reason for this is simple. Uh, the Clean Power Plan was the biggest piece of the Obama administration's emissions reduction strategy. But fuel standards, methane and nitrous oxide, energy efficiency and HFCs, and uh, California's efforts um, also provide or provided significant emissions reductions. Okay, can I ask about the, uh, yes. About the previous slide. Yes. Does that assume that the Trump administration succeeds in handling the policy? Yes. It, right. Right. And. So, so currently, given the current litigation, we're not. We're not yet on that upward track except for that the fuel efficiency standards that the Obama administration put in place in the, power in the Clean Power Plan has been suspended. So these rules were not finalized 
um, when the change in administration came. So we're not seeing those benefits either. OK, so it's in this context that I want to turn to litigation. Right? Have understanding sort of the scientific problem that's ahead of us, the global crisis that we're confronting, and the political failures that we're seeing um, inside the United States. Um, it's in this context that citizens, NGOs, and states and cities are suing to hold their government in this country and in countries around the world accountable for their climate change commitments. In many instances, uh, the arguments made to challenge government actions or inaction include reference to constitutional and statutory provisions not specific to climate change. That is, we're dealing with bo a body of law in the United States and pretty much everywhere else that is not specifically tailored to climate change. Um, in those cases, references to international climate agreements, including the Paris Agreement, which embody both the scientific um, objectives as well as political compromises, often buttress the claims. Right? Um, so we have looked at the climate litigation in, around the world and identified a few sort of major categories. Um, and I'll, from here, I'll start to move more into how the science of climate change attribution intersects with these. But first, I just want to map out for you what the types of lawsuits that we're seeing are. So in many cases, challenges to a project or a policy identify linkages between resource extraction and climate-related impacts, both in the form of emissions due to combustion of extracted fossil fuels and in the form of impairments to resiliency and adaptive capacity. These challenges seek to make those linkages legally significant and either deserving of consideration or else compelling an alternative approach to natural resource management altogether. Now building on the scientific understanding between emissions and climate change, which pol uh, policymakers um, have generally adopted the, the scientific projections as accurate? Uh, there are several cases that seek to establish liability for entities that generate emissions with full knowledge of those emissions' ultimate effect on the global climate. Um, so that's the second category there, linking resource extraction to climate impacts. Um, establishing causation um, for purposes of legal liability also fa falls into that category. Pursuing non-statutory legal mechanisms for mitigation. Litigants um, in the US and elsewhere are making arguments for climate change action based on the public trust doctrine, which assumes, uh, or I'm sorry, assigns the state responsibility for the integrity of a nation's natural resources uh, for both current and future generations. These claims raise fundamental questions of individuals' rights and intergenerational equity, as well as concerns about the balance of powers among the judicial, legislative, and executive branches or functions of government. Finally, establishing liability for failure to adapt. The technical understanding of climate change and the quality of predictions about future temperature, weather, extreme events are all um, already at a very high level and they continue to improve. Recognizing that adaptation efforts have not kept pace with these improvements, litigants are bringing claims that seek to assign responsibility where failures to adapt result in foreseeable material harms. So in the time that I have left, I want to talk about two of these types of cases, the public trust cases and the nuisance claims. Um, so starting off with the nuisance claims, as many of you are likely aware, um, over the last year, or year and a half, um, more than a dozen cities, um, counties, the state of Rhode Island, and now also a um, association of Pacific fishermen have filed lawsuits in the United States, generally in state courts under a variety of state laws, um, against fossil fuel companies, seeking compensation or abatement or some form of monetary damages for the impacts of climate change. Um, these represent sort of clusters of the, of the cases, um, but they are illustrative. So um, they raise a number of different types of claims. Almost all of them raise public nuisance as a claim. Uh, several of them also raise private nuisance. Most of them also raise trespass. Um, and then a few of the cases, or buckets of cases, raise failure to warn and design defect, which may be understandable as product liability type claims. Um, there's an allegation of civil conspiracy, state statutory claims, uh, and the public trust in Rhode Island. Um, so we're seeing a variety of, 
legal uh, innovations, legal approaches. All of these are filed under <coughs> state laws to hold fossil fuel companies accountable for climate change. The, they also address a range of different types of impacts. Um, so almost all of the cases, except for the cases filed by Boulder County and the city of Boulder in Colorado, raise um, concerns about the impacts of sea level rise in coastal communities. Um, many of the cases uh, raise concerns about the impacts related to climate impacts on the hydro hydrologic cycle. This can include both extreme precipitation events uh, as well as drought conditions on the other side. Uh, a few of the cases talk about public health impacts um, on communities and individuals, and then there are a range of other types of impacts that are raised in these cases. Juliana versus the United States. So in this case, um, 21 youth plaintiffs filed a lawsuit in federal district court in Oregon against the United States government asking the court to compel the government, the federal government, to take action to reduce uh, carbon dioxide emissions so that atmospheric concentrations will be no greater than 350 parts per million by 2100. That is, they're seeking a drawdown because we're already at approximately 410, right? Um, so they're seeking a, a, a global drawdown based on, on domestic policy. The plaintiffs in this case allege that the nation's climate system is critical to their constitutional rights, to life, liberty, and property, and that the defendants have violated their substantive due process rights by allowing fossil fuel production, consumption, and consumption at dangerous levels. Um, the plaintiffs also allege that the failure to control greenhouse gas emissions constitutes a violation of their constitutional right to equal protection um, before the law as they are being denied the same sorts of fundamental rights afforded to prior and present generations. That's the significance of this being a youth brought lawsuit. Um, youth are being impacted differently. Um, that puts them in a uh, negative relationship to, the, to my generations and, and older generations. So um, finally, they also allege that there's a violation of the public trust doctrine uh, in the, fail the government's failure to regulate and its affirmative decisions in uh, allowing for fossil fuel extraction on public lands. So that's an, a simplification of the case, but it's good enough for the time being. Um, what's happened with it to date? Well, a federal district court judge in Oregon who was assigned to the case uh, the day after President Trump was elected issued a decision denying the government's motion to dismiss this case. Um, and uh, they, th this decision was issued the day after the election while the conference of the parties uh, to the UNFCCC was meeting in Marrakesh, Morocco for the follow-up meeting to the Paris Agreement. There was a lot of emotion sort of circulating around the conference that day. I happened to be there. Um, and this decision came as something of a, of a ray of light uh, on what seemed to many in that, in that place, or pretty much everybody in that place, to be a fairly dark day for climate ambition and climate action. Um, the district court judge declared that there is a constitutional right to a stable climate system um, and declared that the plaintiffs, that the, the youth plaintiffs in this case, had standing to be in court to raise the claim of the constitutional violations, um, and that it, it does impose affirmative obligations on the government to take action. Exactly what that meant was left up in the air. It was an early stage, the motion to dismiss stage, and so the course was set for trial. Since then, um, the federal government has gone to the Supreme Court three different times to seek um, Supreme Court intervention in order to stop the trial. It's gone to the Ninth Circuit twice, um, once it's tried to skip over the Ninth Circuit in order to get the Supreme Court's appeal. Long story short, um, the Ninth Circuit has the case right now on appeal on the motion to dismiss. There has not been a trial. It seems to me quite likely that there will not be a trial, but I'm happy to talk about that afterwards if you like. Um, and, um, and the oral argument is scheduled for early June. Okay. So how does det det detection and attribution science sort of factor into these cases and other cases? And I'm, I also want to just clarify that I am talking about the relationship between detection and attribution uh, research and litigation here. But obviously, the science has been deeply influential in forming international and domestic policy in the United States and elsewhere. Um, and it plays a significant role in environmental assessment and in environmental planning at every level, the nas international, national, 
local and corporate uh, levels all engage in this sort of research increasingly to better understand the causes and effects of climate change. But I'm going to focus on, on litigation. So this research is at the core of these lawsuits. Um, the research is aimed at linking human activities to changes in the climate system and the corresponding impacts on people's lives and the planet. Um, we, uh, in, in the paper that sort of forms the basis for this part of, the, of my talk, have looked at um, the research and decided to take um, an approach that is roughly similar to um, the IPCC approach. Um, and we look at this in terms of climate change attribution, impact attribution, extreme event attribution, and then source attribution, which is a different category, not really addressed at length um, by that literature. So climate change attribution, of course, seeks to answer the broader question of how human activities uh, are affecting the global climate system. Extreme event attribution, how are the changes in the global system affecting extreme event characteristics? Impact attribution, how do the changes affect other interconnected natural and human systems? And then source uh, attribution, to what extent are different sectors, different activities, and different entities uh, responsible for climate change? And on this one, it's important to note that determinations of responsibility or fault will inevitably reflect normative considerations as well as scientific uh, approaches and findings. So you won't be able to read this, um, but the basic point here is that scientists assign different levels of confidence or certainty to work within these different streams. Um, climate change attribution, of course, um, has fairly high levels of certainty uh, in regards to heat, uh, to global warming and sea level rise. Uh, impact attribution, there is more uncertainty. Um, there are so many other factors that can affect human and natural systems uh, that it is often difficult to separate out the effect from, of anthropogenic climate change from those other factors. But that is an area of continued research and things are growing in that area. Extreme event attribution, confidence and certainty in findings here depends on the type of event uh, that you're, that's being studied. Heat-related events, for instance, um, from what my conversations with scientists, um, they, the, the, the sort of common understanding is that one can draw relatively robust um, connections between uh, extreme heat events and the anthropological influence in other areas such as hurricanes, um, cyclones, and drought, it may be more complex. Uh, and then in source attribution. Um, in recent years, researchers have started to make a concerted, have started to make progress towards identifying respective cumulative greenhouse gas contributions from nations and from the so-called carbon majors. And in this regard, um, one report in particular has been highly influential in influencing the course of climate change litigation that we've seen uh, in recent years. And this is a report from Richard Heavey, uh, who's an sci uh, independent scientist uh, based in Colorado. Um, and what he did was he basically looked at years and years of documentary evidence, corporate reports, basically, and securities filings um, to see how much uh, product different fossil fuel companies had put into commerce uh, and then applied emissions factors to the coal, oil, and gas um, and came up with a ranking that uh, breaks out by oil and gas, uh, coal, cement, flaring, vented CO2, and um, other categories. This produced a list of um, investor and state-owned oil and uh, other fossil fuel, fossil fuel producers and the attributed emissions. Um, what you, one of the things that you can note here is that the defendants in the lawsuits um, that cities, counties, and uh, the state of Rhode Island and the Pacific Fishermen's Association have brought are all uh, investor-owned. Uh, companies, Chevron, Exxon, BP, Shell, um, ConocoPhillips, uh, the state-owned enterprises, Saudi Aramco, National Iranian, Pemex, Ku Kuwait Petroleum, and so, uh, et cetera, are not named as defendants in those cases, um, despite the fact that they are uh, major contributors to the problem. Also happy to talk about why that may be if, if you're interested. Um, so um, at this point in time, I think it's fair to say that the detection and attribution research, including the source attribution research, um, has not yet 
played a determinative role in any of the climate change litigation that we've seen to date. Uh, courts, by and large, accept the basics of climate science. Um, actually, I should say, I have not yet read in a, a judicial opinion in which a court has taken any serious issue with the basics of detection and attribution science. Um, but nor has any case gotten to the point where the real debates around impact attribution and source attribution have been material to the outcome. So what might this look like if we do get to that point? Um, Juliana versus the United States uh, offers one case study because um, in the process of preparing for trial, the plaintiffs submitted over 1,000 pages in expert reports, and the US government submitted something around somewhere about half that uh, amount of ex uh, pages in, in expert reports, giving us something of a preview of what a battle of the experts when it comes to impact attribution and source attribution might, might look like. Um, so um, what are the key questions in the Juliana case? Well, the, in terms of climate change attribution, it's not re the, the basics of attribution. Again, it's not really in dispute. Everyone agrees in that case, including our federal government, that greenhouse gases cause climate change. Source attribution, to what extent is the United States government responsible for climate change? Well, here we have a clear split. The plaintiffs um, used different techniques to come at their numbers. Um, the plaintiffs allege that the US government is responsible for at least 25.5% of cumulative greenhouse uh, carbon dioxide emissions. These are territorial emissions, emissions that are from within the United States, and plaintiffs note that if you took a different approach, for instance, including consumption-based emissions, um, it would be much higher. Uh, and that extraction-related emissions are not fully reflected in territorial emissions because some of our fossil fuels are exported. Um, but they do not present any clear argument that a different approach ought to be used. Um, Professor Jim Hansen um, offered some testimony on this regard. Uh, and he, his testimony centers ultimately on the US contribution. And he notes that the United States alone is responsible for a 0.15 degrees Celsius increase in global temperature. Um, the plaintiffs also focus on contributions since 1990. Um, and there are reasons for doing this. Um, but uh, without going down that, that rabbit hole, um, the basic argument is that if the government had acted on expert rec recommendations on how to limit greenhouse gas emissions issued by EPA back in 1990 um, and by the Congressional Office of Technology Assessment back in 1991, then US greenhouse gas emissions would have been reduced by 35% from 1987 levels today rather than the increase that we've seen. Now, how does the government respond to this sort of allocation of responsibility? Um, they do concede, ultimately, uh, this, they, that there's a certain number of cumulative territorial emissions, but they claim that this total cumulative amount is equal to only 4 to 5% of global totals. So they have a much different calculation on what the global totals are. And then ultimately, they raise the argument that the United States <coughs> cannot be held responsible for all emissions from private activities within its jurisdiction. So it can't be held liable for constitutional violations because of the actions undertaken by private entities, including both fossil fuel companies and individual consumers within the territory of the United States. Impact attribution is also a significant uh, dividing point in the case. Um, are plaintiffs injuries caused by climate change? Plaintiffs allege a variety of injuries, primarily from environmental changes such as sea level rise, decreases in water supply, loss of snowpack, and to a more limited extent, extreme events. Um, uh, in their expert reports that were filed, uh, experts were able to draw a relatively robust link between climate change and those injuries in some cases, particularly where there was downscaled climate data available. For example, when it comes to sea level rise. Uh, in a particular town where one particular plaintiff lived, um, and even in relationship to extreme events that affected uh, plaintiffs. But many of the, the connections that the experts drew in those expert reports are qualitative inferences about how broader trends related to climate change have affected or may affect the plaintiffs. So in one instance, 
there's a plaintiff who moved from her home in Cameron, Arizona, because the springs her family had depended on for water were drying up. Um, and one expert noted that the, quote, pattern of drought in places like Arizona is directly linked to climate change without citing to any research attributing the arid conditions in that particular area to climate change. This was called out by the other side. Similarly, uh, experts reporting on public health impacts note that the youth plaintiffs, like all children, are at a higher risk of certain health problems, such as asthma, um, and that the experts had not provided any evidence attributing these specific health problems experienced by these specific plaintiffs to climate change. Um, so the experts for the defendants pointed at these missing links um, in, and specifically honing in on unsupported causal statements. So they're really attacking the chain of causation that can link them and their actions to uh, the harms that are experienced by plaintiffs. Um, the nuisance claims. So um, again, I want to point out that there are the, I'm just using nuisance as a shorthand for all of the state-based common law uh, and statutory uh, claims that the, the plaintiffs are making. The plaintiffs in these cases are still struggling to get past procedural hurdles. Uh, so there hasn't been an opportunity to develop a factual record um, like there was in Juliana. But we can identify the key issues um, from the complaints and project how they might play out in the courtroom nonetheless. Um, climate change attribution, again, is not really likely to be in dispute. Um, you might have heard of the quote unquote science tutorial that a federal district cut court judge in San Francisco held in order to better inform himself about the science of climate change um, while overseeing a lawsuit filed by San Francisco and Oakland against the fossil fuel companies. After holding this, um, this day-long tutorial, um, the judge wrote an opinion dismissing the case. And among the, the, the different things that he said was, science is not the issue in this case. Right? So, um, Impact and source attribution. If these cases make it to trial, establishing both impact and source attribution will be absolutely essential to plaintiff's claims because they're seeking monetary damages. Um, in most cases, plaintiffs are relying primarily on sea level rise uh, to support their claims. And this is a smart approach because there's a relatively direct link that has been very well established between sea level rise and anthropogenic influence on climate. Um, but they must also establish that the specific harms and specific risks by specific pieces of coastal infrastructure um, were caused by sea level rise and not other factors, such as real estate development and the desirability of certain areas for, um, for market reasons um, and other government decisions that were fundamentally unrelated to climate change or climate risk. Source attribution. Um, so this goes directly to the Haiti study. Um, the complaints don't specifically sort of frame their complaints in relationship to the Heavey study, although they do cite to it um, in, the, in footnotes. And sometimes in the text, there's a reference to it. Um, but, so we can just use that as a proxy. And you, one can assume that the companies are going to contest this approach to assigning responsibility. Right? It's, a, it's an approach that's based on counting the quantity of fossil fuels that were extracted by particular actors assigning an emissions factor to those fuels, and then saying you're responsible for all of that. Um, the companies, just like the, go the government did in Juliana, are going to contest that approach. They'll propose different methodologies. They'll seek to poke holes in that methodology. And we'll see where the court comes out on it. So recognizing that I've gone on for a bit here, um, I think I'll come to a close and just note that ultimately, it is unclear whether any of these issues will make it to trial in any of these cases. Right? The science of climate change attribution um, has been, as I said earlier, absolutely essential to climate change policy making and decision making uh, from the get go, and it remains so. It has also been essential to climate change litigation. You can go back to the case of Massachusetts versus EPA, where state of Massachusetts and others sued EPA to force it to regulate greenhouse gases. And in that lawsuit, the plaintiffs complained of the impacts of sea level rise um, on Massachusetts and the loss of, of territory, as well as impacts on snowpack, drought conditions in the Midwest, um, the increased risk of wildfire, and a number of other different types of risks. So they were already back in 2004 relying on this same sort of information, although it was much less well-developed than it is today. 
but it was not central ultimately to the court's decision, not the contest about the science. Ultimately, there are two big barriers um, that the plaintiffs in Juliana and in the fossil fuel company cases are facing. Um, one is that these cases, uh, the, the defendants in the fossil fuel companies are seeking to make these state law claims federal. And if they can succeed in making them federal claims, then plaintiffs will have um, two very high hurdles to get over. One is precedent, Supreme Court precedent, which held that the Clean Air Act allocated responsibility or authority to EPA to regulate greenhouse gas emissions. And therefore, common law nuisance type lawsuits are displaced. There's no more room for them in the, in the federal court system. And the second is separation of powers. Um, judges declining to adjudicate claims based on concerns about their, the question being a political question that's best reserved for the political branches, or a, it's a foreign affairs issue that is preempted under the foreign affairs preemption doctrine, or something else. Um, that question of separation of powers will play through even if the cases do remain in state court. And that's because they raise on a fundamental level the question of who should be deciding the nation's climate policy. Um, the courts, the executive branch, or, uh, or the legislature. And courts to date have been very reluctant to wade too deep into those waters, um, even while holding the government to account in some instances. So with that, I'll say thank you very much. Look forward to some Q&A. Yes. Why was tobacco different? That's, uh, so some people don't think it is. Um, uh, <laughs> um, I think that the, the way that tobacco is similar is that there's the same history. And it's the same playbook on the history, right? The fundamental storyline is that industry knew for a long time about the dangers of their product. They created a smoke screen around the science and the degree of certainty around uh, the risks that that, um, that that product was creating. And they lobbied actively against any regulation. So they knew, they lied about it, and they took alternative actions. That storyline is the same in both cases. But I think, honestly, at that point, um, the similarities come to an end. Um, the big difference, of course, is that tobacco is a product that causes a direct harm. The, the chain of causation goes from the cigarette to the lungs. Um, and that's all there is to it. It's a, it's a product that, that has one step. Um, climate change, of course, has many more steps in the causal chain. And there are a lot more actors that are involved. And so it's much easier for the fossil fuel companies to argue that they're not solely responsible, even if they bear some degree of responsibility. And they even go so far as to argue that they're not responsible at all for the harms. They do say, argue that they're responsible for the gains and all of the um, benefits that fossil fuel development has provided to civilization and continues to provide. The economic development, literally the world that we live in. Um, so they have a much easier time making those arguments. And one last thing I would say is, uh, fossil fuel industry representatives have not yet, to my knowledge, um, lied to Congress under oath. Yes. Thank you. So um, one of the objections that's often made in terms of historical accountability is something about not being able to foresee the harm. Unless I missed it, I didn't see that as being one of the things you laid out as being one of the major obstacles to interpretation. So that's surprising. Why is that? Well, I think that foreseeability is a major um, uh, will be a, a significant obstacle, but it's, but it's one that the, the science helps a lot, um, will help plaintiffs get over. Um, so that is one of the reasons that plaintiffs in these cases, I believe, are focusing on 1990 as a key year, because it's at that point that the global consensus around climate change, the scientific consensus around climate change started to mobilize a global uh, political response. Um, and it's virtually impossible for defendants to argue at that point that they just, you know, nobody really knew what was going on because so the negotiations. So the, the, the investigative reporting that's gone on, that has unearthed um, a good number of documents that show the extent of uh, industry knowledge and the duration of industry knowledge are absolutely critical to creating the storyline. Um, and that has two things. There's a legal component to that, which is about foreseeability, and then there's a, you know, a narrative component to that, which is about culpability and blame. Um, and it's powerful, I think, on, on both fronts. Um, 
scientists, what, what industry scientists have been able to argue to date is that what they knew was not any significantly different from what anyone else knew, right? They have, there are internal documents showing that they knew, uh, but there are also, you know, Lyndon Johnson was asking Congress to regulate greenhouse gases in 1965, so a lot of people knew. Yes? Well, you said that Juliana probably wouldn't come to trial. Yes. Okay, so this is a little bit of legal gaming, uh, and the attorneys there would be very unhappy with me for saying this, um, but I do think it's, a, it's my own honest assessment of the, of the case. Um, the case is now before the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals, and there are two major legal issues that are there. One is, does the Constitution protect the right to a stable climate system? Um, the other is, does the public trust doctrine require the federal government to do anything in particular in this context or in any other context. And there's bad precedent on both of those cases. No court in the United States, no federal court, has ever found a constitutional right to a healthy environment, um, to a safe environment, to any particular level of environmental protection. So the, the district court's finding of the right to a stable climate system, which depends not just on domestic actions, but on global actions uh, and coordinated global action, was truly unprecedented path-breaking um, and a significant development, but one that the Ninth Circuit panel hearing this case is going to have to think carefully about how the Supreme Court will respond to it. And right now, I just don't think that the Supreme Court uh, is in a position to make a, a finding that there's a constitutional right to a stable climate system. I hope I'm wrong about that, but if the court as currently constituted is the one that hears that appeal, I, don't, I, I think it's a, gonna be a very, very, very tough sell. On the public trust doctrine, the D.C. Circuit Court of Appeals, in an earlier iteration of this public trust litigation, and in a case called Alec L. versus McCarthy, which was a, uh, a, a lawsuit originally brought by uh, youth plaintiffs against the Obama administration, alleging a failure to uh, live up to its trust obligations and regulate greenhouse gas emissions, uh, against EPA in particular, <clears throat> the D.C. Circuit made a determination based on some language in a Supreme Court case that the public trust doctrine is a matter of state law, not federal law. Uh, and so it just doesn't apply to the federal government. Um, I think the plaintiffs have done a great job of countering that argument and presenting a compelling legal story as to why um, it's not exactly right. Uh, but nonetheless, the precedent is there. And um, again, I think looking at the Supreme Court reviewing a decision by the Ninth Circuit Court of Appeals um, those are two legal issues that don't require a trial for the courts to get rid of this case. And I do hope I'm wrong. Yes? Yes. Yeah, I mean, you go to court when nothing else works, right? Court is last resort. Um, and uh, for climate change, <clears throat> for this country to deal effectively with climate change will require a radical transformation of our energy systems, our transportation infrastructure, increased resiliency in our built environments and in our natural environments. And courts just are not authorized to require the range of actors that are required to take action to take the specific actions that are needed. So I think that courts have a definite role to play in this, and they have always had a role to play in uh, supporting domestic climate policy. But ultimately, the first and best option would be a comprehensive piece of federal legislation that would regulate all of the sectors that need regulating um, and provide um, an equitable approach to allocating the winners and losers in that ultimately legislative bargain. Yes, so um, currently there's an investigation that has been launched by the Philippines National Human Rights Commission in response to a petition that was filed by Greenpeace Southeast Asia and a couple hundred Philippine citizens. And that is an investigation into the fossil fuel companies. <clears throat> and the question is whether or not they violated Philippine human rights under domestic law. It's an investigation that won't amount the, the end result won't be damages or monetary compensation or anything like that, but potentially a declaratory judgment of a violation of human rights. That's one form. 
that we may see take on iterations in other countries. Um, but the idea of a small island state suing the fossil fuel companies um, has long been talked about. And um, the environment minister of Palau recently voiced that they were considering um, undertaking that approach. It would rely on the same sorts of science. Right? The, the, the connection between the science and the law would be, would be, if not precisely the same, very much similar. They would be suing most likely under their own domestic laws rather than the laws of the United States. Um, and they would need to seek to enforce that judgment in the United States, the Netherlands, the UK, France, so forth and so on. But um, the, <clears throat> the fundamental issues would be very much the same. You have a follow up and then. Mm. So in terms of suing countries, um, the approach would be to go to the International Court of Justice. And um, the jurisdiction of the ICJ it requires consent. Uh, and so there's an initial problem, which is that the US would be highly unlikely to accept the jurisdiction of the ICJ to overhear a bilateral or multilateral dispute. Um, so an alternative approach that has been pursued and uh, is being pursued again is to persuade the United Nations General Assembly to pass a resolution requesting an advisory opinion from the ICJ. That would not result in any mandatory action, but would result or could result in a declaration of international law principles and how they apply to, to climate change. Oh, did you have a question before? So, yes. Yes. And in federal court, are there appropriate, can you take depositions prior to the summary judgment and if depositions were taken, are they available? The second <coughs> has there been any action by Native Americans under the <coughs> treaty rights to try and relitigate some of the language in the treaty rights that protects them to, for clean water? So on the Juliana case, you're correct. It did, after one of the appeals um, upheld the motion to dismiss, proceed through discovery. There were, I believe, some number of depositions, but not all depositions were taken. Uh, and then there was a motion for summary judgment that was filed. So um, are the depositions publicly available? Not to my knowledge. The expert reports are on our website in our climate change litigation database. Um, Indian treaty rights. Uh, this has been talked about. I've heard, and I've heard it more recently come back up again um, as a potential novel legal theory to pursue in order to force government action. Um, in my mind, it, uh, it evokes an earlier conversation that environmentalists and others engaged in around the question of whether the Endangered Species Act provides a means to require the federal government to take action. That is, pointing to an impact on a protected resource. Under, in the ESA context, sp species protected under the ESA. In the treaty rights context, it would be water or access to lands or to some cultural resources that are being adversely impacted by climate change. And in other instances, there may be other resources. And relying on that as a way to say, to, to argue that the federal government has to take comprehensive action on climate change. And um, I think that there may be some possibility in that. Ultimately, the, the ESA route was not pursued. Um, and the Clean Air Act wound up being the way that, that people went. Um, but I haven't looked closely at, at how that would work in the treaty rights context. So we're, we're a little over 1 o'clock. Uh, are there any other questions? Great, well thank you all very much.